Well, hello everyone and welcome to another session of the Coronavirus Community Forum organized by Singapore Connect uh, in conjunction with some of our very key partners, the Singapore um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the uh, Singapore Global Network, as well as some of our very, very special guest speakers whom we will introduce to you shortly. So with us today on the call, we have Daryl, we have Hui Hui, we have Karen, David, and Mark. Um, together, we have been organizing these sessions. Today is probably our seventh already in the series ever since we started on March um, 15. And in this past couple of months, we've been going through a number of very serious topics, such as what coronavirus is, the impact it has in Singapore, what, how we should prepare ourselves in the Bay Area, um, how we should prepare ourselves at home and in our workplace in terms of our mental health, in terms of our relationship with our folks, what, what has the, the cure, the search for the cure been like out there in the world as well. We've been very privileged to have guest speakers from our Singaporean community to in, keep us informed, right, of what's happening real time and with real information uh, and real insights. So today, our segment is going to be focused on food. We're going to be talking about keeping the hawker food culture alive. And we've been super lucky to have with us uh, not just the feedback from the community, but also three practitioners who have been feeding us you know, with our favorite food, uh, Shok, Nanya, and Sate by the Bay. Um, and then we also have Wilson Koo, as many of you know, who have, you know, has been driving a lot of uh, the engagement with the Singaporean community. Um, we also have with us Dennis Go, who is, many of you might know as the co-founder of Hungry Go Where, um, one of the, Singapore, the largest Singapore sites, right, for um, uh, food and uh, it's sort of like the Yelp of, of Singapore. So I'll, uh, I'll introduce all of these uh, key players uh, later on, um, as we go through our agenda today, um, as usual, we will begin with a you know pre-call survey and sentiment check just to ensure that everybody you know we're all understanding so sort of where we are and, and reflecting some of the feedback you've been sharing with us uh, from a survey perspective and what your sentiments are with respect to uh, you know COVID-19 and shelter in place as well as moving back to Singapore and the likes. And then we'll go into our topic, a feature topic of the day, which is keeping the hawker food culture alive. And then we'll go into additional Q and A. So um, we have a really packed agenda tonight. I think everyone's been super excited about the topic. I, for one, have been dreaming of Singaporean food, uh, not just for today, but for the past week as we have been putting this topic together. So without uh, further ado, uh, great. So we're going to head over and as we think about the FMB and retail sectors opening, we talked about how important, uh, you know, it is to keep our food culture, hawker food culture alive here too. Um, and so we're going to cover a couple of key things in our segment today on the hawker food uh, culture. The first is what the community has been telling us, and this is the feedback you've been sharing with us. Um, then we will have the feature uh, discussions from Shiok, Nanya, and Sate by the Bay. And of course, then we will have uh, Wilson talking about the community engagement activity that we've been having around uh, ordering the food, you know, and helping to transport them around, which is phenomenal exercise. To make this possible, we've been super lucky to have with us here, as I mentioned, the three restaurant owners, Dennis, Tommy, and Ellie. And then from a community engagement perspective, Willem, Wilson Ku, And uh, we have with us Dennis Go as well. Actually, I wasn't able to do a sound test with him to see if he's joined us yet. Um, and if he's with us, that's perfect. Um, I do see him online. It's just not, I'm not sure if his sound is on. Um, but he was a co-founder of Hungry Go Where, um, a company that was acquired by Singtel in 2012. Actually, if I may, I'm just going to have him introduce himself really quickly so that we can have him kind of set the stage because it would be interesting to hear some of his commentary as we go through the data and information as we go through today's session. Dennis, are you with us? Yes, I am, Jasmine. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Hi. really good to be here. Hi, Dennis. Great to have you. And thank you so much for joining us at such short notice. Can it's you tell us... Yes, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about Hungry Go Where and um, what the experience has been in Singapore as well as as far as you know, right? For some of the uh, the F and B sector that uh, today. Right. 
Uh, well, uh, I started Hungry Go Where in the year 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really quite some time ago. Uh, and I think things have changed a lot since then. But I think there's some common uh, pressure points that still remain. So uh, F&B sector is known to be extraordinarily tough. Uh, I think it's a little bit different in the US compared to Singapore. But in Singapore, the, 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 uh, the joke is always that you, you work the first 20 days, right, to actually pay the landlord, right, mm -hmm. because the rent is so high. And then you work the next uh, seven days, right, to actually uh, pay your, your, your team members, right, your staff, and, and deservedly so. Mm -hmm. And then you need the last three days, right, uh, for yourself, the F&B owner. So, so there's a kind of economics we're looking at. And I think, I think it's fairly similar today, actually. Uh, and rentals have actually gone up. So, so I think now the F&B sector as a whole in, in Singapore is really going through a very, very, very tough time. I, I haven't begun to, uh, I, I haven't exaggerate this, right? Uh, like when I talk to the Restaurant Association of Singapore, uh, the, the numbers are truly dire. Because mm -hmm. I think that demand shocks, and this is something I'm sure we're going to go into uh, as we go into the conversation, demand shocks are notoriously difficult to to bring back, right? I mean, the Fed, the central banks around the world can do all they want on the supply side, but on the demand side, right, psychologically, it's hard to actually bring everyone back. It's not like a light, it's not like a switch. You can just turn it on and it all comes back. So yeah, it's it's tough and I, and I totally, I totally empathize with that, yeah. Wow, yeah, thanks for that commentary, Dennis. That's super helpful for us to understand. And I think as we go through this, we'd certainly appreciate some of your feedback as, as we, um, you know, as we go through some of the, the topics of concern here, um, given that you've interacted with a number of restaurant owners uh, through their businesses um, as well. So perfect. Thank you for joining us today again. So in today's segment, everyone, we're going to cover a couple of things. The first segment, as we mentioned, is about what the community has been telling us and what, and we'll cover these questions in this section related to how often we used to cook and in, eat, you know, cook our own food versus eat out. Um, you know, how do we prefer to access our food? How do we think recovery will take and what's our favorite food? As well as some historical information on the restaurants that we like in the Bay Area. Um, for this section, I'd like to invite Mark Sin, who pulled together a lot of the study related to this, this section. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Jasmine. Our first survey question was to gauge the change in cooking at home versus eating out. As many of you now work from home, we would expect far more cooking at home, even with the option of food delivery. Before COVID-19, on average, half of the meals were home cooked and half were eating out, possibly at a work cafeteria. During COVID-19, the number of home cooked meals went up from eight to 14 or 70%, while the number of meals not home cooked went down from nine to three or about 60%. Or in other words, six meals a week went from restaurant cooked to home cooked. We see something else interesting when looking at the details. Here are two charts. The top shows restaurant meals, the bottom shows home cooked meals. For restaurant, the darker red shows before and the lighter red shows after. The gray dash vertical line shows the average. For home, the darker green shows before and the lighter green shows after. For restaurant meals, the first observation is there is a pretty wide range with the red bars seen almost uniformly from zero to 19 meals a week, even though the average is nine a week. This shows that some of you did not eat out a lot while some of you ate out almost exclusively. And bear in mind, we asked you to count eating at a cafeteria as eating out. So for many, they probably had five meals a week when eating out at work. Now, with, for most with work from home, it's only zero to four meals that they're getting from a restaurant a week. For home cooked meals, what's interesting is this cluster around 19 to 21 meals a week. There are some who have gone almost exclusively home cooked. Also, despite the average being eight, you can see a substantial number of people who only did one to seven meals a week at home before COVID-19 that was actually pretty uniformly spread out. Overall, we think this data is consistent with most people. If they used to eat at their work cafeteria five days a week and eat out once a week, 
these six meals a week have now shifted to home cooked meals at home. I'm not sure how that's, that's one person who's able to do 20 meals a week outside during COVID-19. We've seen a lot in the news about delivery companies taking a 30% cut from restaurants on top of what they charge you for delivery and you pay the delivery partner in tips. So we in the restaurant owners got curious how many of you use these delivery companies. Interestingly, more than half do not use food delivery companies. Of these, DoorDash is the most popular delivery company followed by Uber Eats and Postmates. There's only a small percentage who have used other, perhaps Wilson's operation. Next slide is on how long do we think recovery will take. Soberingly, most of you think it will take a long time before the restaurant scene returns to what it was like before COVID-19, if it does. Indeed, a quarter of you think it will take more than two years and only 11% think it will be within three months. A number of you have asked if there could be more restaurants serving your hot area. Invariably, that's somewhere in the East Bay. And well, let's see how many of you reside there. This data is actually in line with past surveys we've done. It shows that the bulk are in the South Bay, followed closely by the peninsula region. The number in San Fran and the East Bay are about the same, or about the six of you are in the East Bay. There are some others who could be folks attending from other parts of the US. We didn't get responses from those who said that they are residing in Singapore. Which Singaporean dish do we miss the most? This was the hardest one to pinpoint to a dish, but we have three main winners here, which is, which are bak chor mee, cha kway teow, and laksa. Rojak and chicken rice are not doing too bad. Then it's a whole lot of others in the ones and twos. Let's talk about some restaurant surveys that Singapore Connect has been doing over the last 10 years. We focused on the Singaporean, Malaysian, and Indonesian cuisine, uh, and we've been doing them every three years or so, starting in 2009. This list shows the restaurants listed in the 2009 survey versus those listed in the 2019 one. Notably, many names in 2009 aren't around anymore. First off, we asked, which restaurant do you most often go to? Counting the numbers, we can see two consistent trends from 2009 to 2019. Shook and Lion Lion, a well-known Malaysian restaurant. We shall sorely miss Bay Leaf, which served Indonesian cuisine. Ipoh Garden made a strong showing in 2019, however, and so did this restaurant that Wilson will talk later about, chicken meats rice, that just specializes in one dish. Next on our survey, we asked, which is the best for Singaporean food? Only. And the clear winner from 2009 to 2019 is Shok. Though, again, interestingly, for 2019, we see chicken meats rice and guy chicken rice show up. By the way, legend has it that Prima Taste used to make all their food using the sauces from Prima Taste packets. Also, please note that Kopitiam listed in 2009 is a different restaurant than the Kopitiam Cafe that showed up in 2012 and onwards. Next, our restaurant survey asked, which restaurant is best for this dish? There were many more local favorites asked. I only picked the top six that were more obvious in preference. For Hokkien Mee, a clear winner across all four surveys is Shook. For chicken rice though, look, Shook had a tie with Lion Lion and Malayan in 2012, but it became chicken meats rice in 2019. Malaysian restaurants Ipoh Garden and Banana Leaf have taken over the dominance for the next three dishes, Chakritao, Seafood Hor Fun, and Roti Prata, and the run at being best at Sate changed from Shook to Ipoh Garden in 2019. Finally, in our comments, we asked folks uh, what events they would like to see regarding restaurants. Uh, before we get there, I want to note that uh, Nonya Cafe opened just after the list was compiled for 2019, but it really made its impression on one participant, especially for Rendang and Kuei. So this idea that we could do, we could try a food festival event where multiple restaurants can serve their signature dishes came out then and has also come up in the survey that we'll talk about later in this presentation. 
Super, moving on ahead. Um, that was really helpful information, I thought, uh, Mark, not just in terms of the survey we just did with uh, many of you here on the call, but also you know, the historical study, right, of, uh, of the number of, uh, of the, our favorite restaurants across the Bay Area. Very interesting information. And as we can tell- yeah, I just want to add, uh, Kopi Tiam, if you look back in time, was a different restaurant than the Kopi Tiam Cafe of today, just in ah, case. Uh, okay. Got it. And, you know, there was a, you know, the Lion, I recall seeing Lion Lion. It was just around my home. And then we had Rasa Prima Sai Taste. too. That's right. Those, those have... Spice Island and Mountain View. Those, those are now gone too, which is uh, really sad. It's really hard to be in this business. So all the more, we really want to encourage the ones that we know are here with us today um, as well. And, you know, we're very happy to have with us um, Shok that has been around for a really long time. Nonya Cafe and Satay by the Bay are new, but we'd love to kind of talk through and get to learn more about their businesses um, from Dennis, Tommy, and Ellie. So um, the segment that we have here focuses on context, COVID-19, the community, support and engagement that's needed, right? In the first section, we'll talk about when they started, how they started, what their favorite dishes are, just to get to learn, learn a little bit more about their restaurants, right? And then talk a, lot, a bit about how COVID-19 has impacted them, both in terms of demand and supply side of things. And finally, we'll go into the community support and engagement and what we can do to help um, them. And this brings us then after this segment um, into Wilson's section, which focuses a lot on community engagement. So without further ado, let me just introduce us to Shok and Dennis. Dennis, welcome to our conversation today. Thank you so much for really being, uh, you know, a, a solid kind of place where Singapore food is being introduced, right, to Americans for so many years. Um, Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about how you started, what inspired you to start, and uh, a little bit more about your business here? I know we have a couple of slides and we can uh, kind of roll through them too as you give us an introduction to your, uh, to Shok. So um, we started about uh, 20 years ago when my sister first moved to the U.S. So she started the restaurant. Um, and then um, after a couple of months, uh, she asked my mom to come over to help. So she came over to, my mom came, my mom came over to help her. And then, um, and then subsequently she, you know, she left the business and mom, my mother was running it. And then about 10 years ago, uh, my mom called me up and said, you know, she doesn't want to do this anymore. So I've, I've taken over. I've taken over from doing that. So uh, the, the reason that we started this um, was because uh, 20 years ago, there wasn't many choices in terms of Singaporean food. And my sister used to, you know, have dinner parties at our house. And all those people come here and they, they found the... Singaporean taste very unique, something that they've never had before. So she thought, hey, maybe she wants to, you know, introduce this food to the Bay Area. And uh, so she has, um, so we have done this for the past 20 years, which, you know, we've seen how the whole, um, you know, the Singaporean uh, Malaysian food scene has transformed from 20 years ago when nobody was doing it to today. There's now quite a lot of people doing which is great because, um, you know, that way there's more awareness of uh, Singaporean and you know, Malaysian food. And that also um, uh, made the pie bigger, uh, which means also made uh, more people, uh, I mean, make, made the market bigger. So it's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy whenever there's new people wanting to, <laughs> you know, come out and, 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 you know, carry the banner and, and um, you know, promote Singaporean food. That's great. Thank you. And I think, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is you've hosted a number of uh, dignitaries at your restaurant as well, as people are curious about what Singapore food is like. Can you tell us about some of your visitors? Oh, yeah. I mean, my, um, I mean, I guess the most uh, um, famous would be uh, Prime Minister Lee. Mm -hmm. So he was here. I mean, uh, to visit his son at one time, and uh, and then I, I had a call from the consulate to say, oh, you know, um, Madam Ho Ching wants to make a reservation. So I thought, oh yeah, well, Madam Ho Ching is coming, that's great. And it's only, you know, like 
may, may two hours before and they say, um, listen, uh, you better uh, be ready because the PM is coming. That was that was very interesting. You know, he had a whole uh, whole posse with Secret Service. That was exciting. And we've also, um, unfortunately enough, to also uh, host uh, Dr. Balakrishna, uh, Minister Yok Yakob, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, Teo Chi Hien. We, we've had them. And uh, we've had, I've also um, had um, uh, Sally Ye. <laughs> she, she, came, she came by sometimes. That's great. And uh, yeah, we, we've hosted some other uh, dignitaries from other countries, like uh, we had the president of the Micronesia, president of Palau, and uh, also our current ambassador. Yeah, awesome. And I see Daryl here too. Daryl, great job. And Daryl, yes, yes. <laughs> Not to mention, <laughs> I, I had his photo there, yes. <laughs> when he right. came, he came, uh, came is, to eat, we you, took a photo with him. <laughs> are you allowed to tell us what PM Lee had? I'm sorry? Are you allowed to tell us what PM Lee had? Uh, PM Lee, yeah, yeah. PM Lee had the chicken rice, uh, the oyster omelette, ah. <laughs> and the Hokkien mee. Wow, that's a lot of food. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, there was uh, three of them. So uh, there was his son, uh, himself, and uh, Madam Ho Ching. And also, uh, he had his whole, um, you know, his, his bodyguards and stuff. That's brilliant. Super inspirational that you started out of potlucks. I had definitely, Singapore Connect was started out of potlucks as well. I had people coming over to my home, you know, because I can't cook, right? But goodness, you know, you guys are talented. You actually made something out of this, which is amazing. So congratulations, kudos to you. Um, as we look at this, I actually, we actually went to your site and downloaded the menu. You have such a repertoire of really mouth-watering delights, right? Many on the top list of foods that everyone, um, you know, would like to, to have as, you know, like the nasi lemak, the laksa, the cha kui tiao, right? Um, lots of uh, awesome familiar favorites from a, a food perspective. So thank you, Dennis. Super excited. To oh, have thank you. you. I, I mean, we depend on the support of uh, Singaporeans here. And, and this COVID-19, I felt has mm -hmm. really, really, um, uh, you know, really showcased you know, how Singaporeans can get together. Uh, truly a kampong spirit. I, I can really feel it. <laughs> fantastic. I mean, really, really fantastic. That's awesome. Well, the link to order more, it's on the bottom left here, so we can ex express more of our kampong spirit. I actually, um, you know, I was joking that I've been welcoming you guys to my home, both, you know, Dennis, uh, Tommy, and Ellie have eaten a lot of your food in my home, but it's so, it's so good to actually be able to interact with you guys here as well together um, to share some of your passion with the rest of the Singaporeans here and to meet you as, as people right behind the business. Um, thank you, Dennis. Let's move on to Tommy. Tommy, uh, newcomer to the business, as we understand, uh, from Nonya Cafe. Tell us thank more you. about your business and how you got started. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. It has been my pleasure and honor to be here, of course. Um, my, uh, my business started about a year ago. My background is like most of the most of the guys in Silicon Valley. I had uh, 20 years of experience in software mainly. Software and recognition, that's my, my expert before. But then about two years ago when I took a career break, uh, my wife had this interest to do some catering service into, and formalize it into retail. So talking about this, uh, our recipe and food, everything comes from my wife and my mother-in-law. About the past 10 years, we have been doing food service and catering, but not in, not in, I haven't got a chance to formalize the business that time. Mm -hmm. So that was the time when we just do uh, food catering and supply, a uh, supply of quays and all these dessert things. If any one of you remembers, we actually supplied to a few restaurants before, mm -hmm. but you might have tried that before, but it was not under our name before. But anyway, uh, fast track to last year. So we started this business. That was the time when we decided to do some business about retail business in uh, quick lunch, quick meal. So that's how we started New York Cafe. Uh, Many is simple, just just um, some quick lunch, quick meals, like all these famous nasi lemak, laksa, karimi, and all these funny 
uh, local food. Plus, also I've seen introduces like uh, all the great, like you can see on the photos. That's that's how we have. So the menu is pretty simple. And thank you for this invitation. I don't have any celebrity or any PM or any anything coming to my my place yet. Hopefully, one day will. Um, and also, pandemic right now is really killing because mm -hmm. of the shelter in, in, in place, we cannot, cannot really go out. And then our business drop a lot, more than half, 70 to 80% too. But uh, thanks to all the support, and we opened up about three weeks ago mm -hmm. for takeout, business was coming back. And I have to say, I have to thank this group here, specifically to Wilson, mm -hmm. who, who came to me and then talk about this this group lunch thing and this then we just started about two weeks ago and 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 so far we see some traffic from there and hopefully we can move on and get better from there all right all right great tommy great to see you and thank you uh, for you know your contributions as well what an exciting menu you have you're actually in the pleasanton area right so it's different dennis is in the menlo park on and whereas you are very much in the East Bay side, so it's uh, it's awesome that we have that spread of coverage across the Bay Area. Um, thanks, and we'll talk a little bit about the COVID nineteen impact as well after this. Um, but thanks, Tommy. Let's move on to Ellie. Ellie's business is different. You guys are just sort of could be everywhere because you're actually a food truck. Yes, Ellie. You have to unmute. Let's. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Welcome, yeah. Ellie. Tell us a little bit about how you started and your business. So I'm just going to point out a little bit here. Uh, we are actually satay by the bay, and I think the word SF should be in the back of it. So we are uh, formally known, I mean, uh, um, we sh we are, our business is known as satay by the bay SF, just to identify Great. between satay by the bay Singapore and SF. Got it. So what was your question again? How we started? Or That's correct. How you started and what your you know, why did you start and, and okay. how did you start and, and what your business is, is like? Okay, I'll make my story really short. So <laughs> actually, I, have, I was um, married my husband about almost 19 years ago, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, moved here, and um, I became an insurance agent for AAA. So I was an insurance agent for, um, I was with AAA for 18 years, was an insurance agent for 13 years, I did very well. Uh, you know, I have that Kiasu attitude that you have to win, right? Die, die, must win, must be the, you know, must be the top agents. And I was doing very well, money was good. Um, I actually started cooking when I was 13, uh, traditional Malay cooking, very machi kind of hawker center style because my mother was a caterer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was not by choice that I learned to cook. I was actually forced to go into the kitchen right after school um, to cook, to help cook, to help do this and that. And um, you know how Asians, when you help your mother, you don't get paid. But you know, <laughs> so I did tell my mother, I said, mom, I said, I swear, when, but when I turn 18, I will never ever cook. So somehow or rather, I subconsciously have, you know, uh, picked up uh, the skill. And um, do I like to cook? Did I like to cook at that time? No, not quite, because I was really busy being a career woman, selling insurance. And, I, and my husband actually um, has been telling me from the beginning that my, my, my cooking is exceptional. Like I can make rendang like a typical machi and I can make lontong like a typical machi. And, 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 and the funny thing was that uh, when he goes to potlucks, he will not eat anybody else's food but mine. And he will go like, okay, this does not taste like my mom's so not my mother-in-law's or something like that so he actually recommended me to open up a food truck a business just satay only like some when the food truck uh culture started uh with like senior sisig maybe about seven to eight nine ten years ago um i said no because uh, i was at the peak of my um career at that time and knowing satay if you guys know that satay is a lot of work so he was saying, Ellie, let's not make a big ones, just make a tiny little ones. And I said, well, that's actually the crazy ones because you got to skewer it one by one. So I said, no, forget about the idea. We almost did go through um, having a food truck at that time, about seven, eight, nine years ago. However, I said, you know what, this is, I'm not ready for it. So um, as times go by, if you work in a corporation for so long and if you're on commission, things change. 
you know, and I, at the point where my, my kids are getting married, I mean, my, one of my kids getting married, I'm going to be a grandmother next month. <laughs> and I was telling David, I was telling my husband, I said, Hey, you know what? Um, I'm at the verge of wanting to retire already. Let's go make, let's go work hard, make money and, you know, do something. And he goes, okay, so I guess you're ready to do on a, go on a food truck business. Actually, he did not say food truck. He wanted to actually just do pop-ups or go into like flea markets and do something small scale. But I said, you know what? I want to have a food truck. He want, he said restaurant. I said, no, I just want a food truck because I want to be where the happening is. I want to move. Maybe I have ADD, ADHD. I don't know. I just like to be, I like to change scene, scenes like every so often. So that was how it happened. And, and the thing is that um, food trucks, you can only specialize in, you can only have certain special signature dishes mm -hmm. because of the kitchen constraint. And as you can see that picture of my food truck, so it's tiny, you know, you can have up to four people maximum to be in the food truck. So basically we picked one, which is satay that David has been talking about. So we're going to do satay and uh, peanut sauce and peanut sauce has to be the bomb. So mm -hmm. my... Uh, I don't think you'll see the picture of my food truck there because if you see on the side of the food truck, there's a couple of a Malay couple, picture of a Malay couple that's actually my grandmother's um, peanut sauce. If you have tried my peanut sauce, so that peanut sauce is actually originated by my grandmother um, and it's very Javanese, it's very Malay, it's pretty spicy, you know, and I take pride in that peanut sauce and that's how it started. And um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you, Jasmine. <laughs> Thank you. You're on mute. So, <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for helping me uh, out here in terms of you know maintaining my keto appetite. This is actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, you guys, <laughs> all three of you, it's been tough doing this because I've been trying to be on a keto diet. I actually did so well to this project, and then I am on keto I diet completely too. <laughs> busted it. Look at what I have here. I have with me here. Wilson, you know, he brought this over. This is terrible. This is Nonya, the cake, Nonya Bata from, from Shuk. This is Dennis's work. And then last week we had Tommy's, uh, his, Tommy's Bachang and your satay as well. So I have your satay peanut sauce in my fridge as we speak. Oh, here's so. another thing that I would like to inter uh, just add in a little bit. Uh, the reason why we want to start a, a food truck, which is also with the Singaporean food, is we want something that is basic and also halal because a lot of my friends who are Malay Muslims, it's, it's hard for them to find a point food that is halal and something that, that is being cooked for them. So, um, and I decided to be the one, okay, I'm gonna represent, okay, so let's, let's do this, you know, and it's all 100% halal. And if it's vegan, it's gonna be 100% vegan. Um, yeah, and we are also on a keto diet, but we're serving non-keto, so there. <laughs> yeah, so maybe maybe you can come up with a keto menu, you know, like so. <laughs> I'm getting a, yes, I'm getting a, a request for that, but we'll come up with that. <laughs> You're very close, just the sugar. I think we talked about this. Well, yes, we did. <laughs> anyway, your menu is very interesting. You have the star, the food coma, then you have the mak cheek and the nonya. This is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just something to tell a story about yeah basically this is my our catering menu this is not on our food truck mm -hmm. because on our food truck typically uh, the food truck menu is always really small mm -hmm. and i learned something from from our friends who actually own businesses and food trucks saying that you know pick three on the item pick three on your food truck and be darn good at it mm -hmm. so we are going to do that and then i mean we have been doing that and then the catering menu is for like a side project you know like side like what we're doing right now which mm -hmm. is called plan b COVID-19 plan B. <laughs> nice, nice. Hey, Dennis, uh, thank you, Ellie. Dennis, yes. as you looked at these menus and these items, how does this differ from Singapore, um, you know, in terms of the taste buds? We, I know we have not rehearsed this at all, so I didn't run through any of my questions with you. So everyone, <laughs> Dennis is going to fly here. But from your experience, are uh, Singaporean taste buds, in terms of what we've favored, uh, similar to what you you saw in Hungry Go Where in Singapore too. Uh, okay, so you know, uh, I I studied I studied overseas, right? And 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 I'm so envious. I'm so envious of all the the students these days, right? Uh, last time in the past, I had to go and you know even make my own uh, laksa and chakuta. No choice. And it was absolutely crap. And 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 I'm I'm just so happy that now uh, there's so many more options. You know, I'm actually shocked, right? Like. 
even like uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, what I saw just seven, eight years ago is so different from today, right? Mm -hmm. The offerings that you have when I was looking through the menus, like what everyone in this, in this forum is saying, I'm so hungry, right? And I'm in Singapore, man, right? Uh, it makes me hungry already just looking at the menu. I said, you have that over there today. Wow, that's really awesome. So to be honest, I don't even think that there's a big difference now. Yes, maybe in terms of the raw materials, right? The ingredients, maybe you have to fly them over and taste slightly different. But you know, I, I think in terms of the menu offerings, it looks exactly the same as, as what I can get back here. It's, it's really amazing. I'm so envious. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you, because we're so envious of you guys out in Singapore, right? <laughs> and I figured I'd get the pro, you know, of Hungry Go Where, who knows where to go for food, uh, to, tell what, uh, to tell us what, what things are. So brilliant. Thank you. So, you know, we have a couple of things that we want to run through with, with uh, you guys here on the call, and a lot of it's related to business today. So we now have a context around, you know, your businesses, right? The restaurants you have, um, when you guys started, and now we're and what you sell and some of the consumers you have. Um, as we go into COVID-19, can you talk to us a little bit about um, you know, the demand that you've had, Dennis, in the restaurant that you've had? Um, you know, looking at the data that we saw earlier that Mark shared with us, certainly a lot of people are now eating home instead of ordering from restaurants. How's that impacted your business? You know, uh, my business has gone down 50 anywhere between 50 to 70%. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have a restaurant, so um, a lot of revenue comes from selling drinks, wine, dessert, and now all that is cut off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we are down to just doing takeout. And takeout, as you know, with DoorDash and Grubhub, they take about 30%. Mm -hmm. So um, I know no, no, no business have 30% margin, as I've said before. I mean, mm -hmm. so now we are giving away 30%. So we're, we're finding it very hard. And um, so we try to do it as much of our own um, takeout as possible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as it is, this is the reality is everybody just whip out their app and just order and now they, they, they just look at, okay, chicken rice or whatever, and they can pick from, you know, whoever's got the cheapest offering. Yeah. And they just order that. And the problem is, uh, you know, pricing, you know, uh, nobody wants to charge high prices. But the reality is pricing strategy is directly um, impacting the viability of, of your business. So if today I start to charge my price, you know, low uh, to compete with everybody else, then um, my business is not viable. And I won't be able to pay my staff properly. It just, it just goes downhill from, from there. I mean, I've been here 20 years. I have seen many um, restaurants open and close. Mm -hmm. And why do they close? They close because, you know, obviously it's not viable. You can, you can, you can run for a while, and then if you are going to compete on price, um, then you are going to run yourself out of business because the reality is I don't want to compare myself with, you know, the next door Chinese, Chinese place who, who, who pays their staff under the table. And uh, I don't know what they do. They buy all the frozen meat. They don't use anything fresh. They just put a bunch of MSG in their food. So, yeah. You know, I don't want to compare with that. We use everything fresh. We cook everything from scratch. And I would like to pride myself with like a, a ramen shop or, or an Italian place, you know. And people will go to a... I mean, I, I don't have complaints from, from you know, uh, my most of my business, 80% 80 of my business is uh, my neighborhood business. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who live around there, they, they are used to going to a restaurant, you know, getting a $20 plate or a $15 plate. So, because in our mindset, I mean, I have the same mindset. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I, I go to Singapore, I eat chocolate here for $5, you know. I come here, I pay this much. But the fact of the matter is, you know, you, you get a mee goreng or whatever. Yeah, if I cook it with nothing, you know, I can be very cheap. But when I, when I cook, when I fix the rumpa, I, I, you know, all this work, you know, my rendang, I, 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 it takes hours upon hours of work. You know, labor is the biggest component mm -hmm. of, of, of my business. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So we, we try our best to, to, you know, price it as reasonable as we can, but we still have to price it so that uh, we can continue as a business. Mm-hmm. We, we, and, and also, um, taste wise, uh, we try, of course, nobody wants to serve food that, you know, even, even my, I'm, every Singaporean is a food critic. I'm a, I'm a big food critic. So if it doesn't satisfy me, I, I will not uh, serve it out. But we are also constrained by um, ingredients. A lot of times, you know, simple thing like you know, just a chili, you know, the, 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 the dried chili, you know. Every time I buy it, the quality is different. Mm. You know, sometimes it's more spicy, sometimes it's less spicy, sometimes the flavor is like that, sometimes the flavor is like that. There's no consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of things that um, we, so we have, we have all these constraints that we work with, but of course we, we try our best to, um, to, you know, carry the flag for Singapore, you know, Singapore food, you know, we want to have a certain standard. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I always tell people, you know, if you compare my Hokkien Mee with somebody in Singapore who, who, whose grandfather and his father, and he now doing Hokkien Mee, he's a, he's an expert. Now, there's no way my Hokkien Mee can ever compare to that. Because I'm, I'm offering, you know, 10 other dishes or 20 other dishes. So um, we try our best. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, like, like, like the other Dennis was saying, you know, truly, I, I, was, I went to school overseas as well. And, and I never had food like this. You know, I have to cook my own crappy food, you know, and, and, and or I will drive, you know, hours upon hours to the next nearest town, whoever, one Singaporean restaurant just to eat, you know, roti prata or something, you know, it's, it's really sad. Mm-hmm. So now people in Bay Area, they're so lucky. I mean, I, I've lived in Australia and, and I, I can't buy chicken rice anywhere, you know, when I was there. Now, you know, you, you get chicken rice in so many places, you get, you know, choices are great now. So, so um, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying is, is, is we, I think all of us here who's doing food business, we want to make it as authentic as possible and to, to, to represent. And we, we do try our best. And, oh, thank and you. We appreciate we, you for that. We love feedback. I mean, I love feedback. I love feedback from especially Singaporeans. Mm-hmm. You can't tell me, oh, today you're not lemak enough. Today, well, let me go and check it out. You know, I will, I'll do better next time. That's, that's, all, I, that's all I can always say. And, and I, do, I really love feedback. And, and, and anybody who has just recently ordered food for me, please drop me, a, drop me an email. Drop me. I need to know how I'm doing so that I can do better. That's you know? awesome. Thank you, yeah, Dennis. Yeah. You've made us feel lucky because this food is actually available to us. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, and you know, sorry to hear about the decline in business because I think, Tommy, you're facing the same thing as well. Um, and you're, you're even younger as a business. I think Dennis has had reputation in the industry for almost 20 years, right? At Shield Cafe. Um, but Tommy, you just started about a year ago. In fact, I was working very close to you guys. I was doing a project out. I was telling you, right? Two miles, one mile from where you were. And I didn't know you were there. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your business today then. Yeah. Thank you, um, Jasmine. We started about a year ago. Uh, business was slow initially, but the first two months was super busy because of new restaurant and a lot of people showed up and eat and critics and talk about how we do, how well, how bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As usual, mostly Malaysian or Singaporeans, but that's okay. If we take all the comments, that's how we get improvement as well. Uh, business catch up, uh, caught up after two, three months and then it started to move up and then we had constant regulars and numbers numbers are okay, sustainable and some profitable as well too. Mm-hmm. But that's just unfortunately when, when this this uh, COVID-19 happened sometime in March when we got shut down, uh, not, not shut down, we had to be, we had to close because of all this work from home. Mm-hmm. On this. So by looking at my sales report, my numbers drop a lot, mm-hmm. up to 70%. I can say that because my my model my um, business is quick service. Mm-hmm. My target is all the working people around us, all the, mm-hmm. all the offices around us. Mm-hmm. They all work from home now. Mm-hmm. We have no business. So yeah. we closed for over a month. And my March sales drop, we opened April three weeks ago, try to come back. And then the numbers, well, you know, because same thing. 
work from home is the main thing and then we don't have incoming customers that that not that many people walk in so we try to do try to survive try to increase the revenue by doing some delivery of course i sign up with orders uh, online platform delivery like doordash postmates um kbeer uh crop hub just like what danny say mm -hmm. they charge 30 percent minimum mm -hmm. all types of fees mm -hmm. i sign up just leave it there and i don't have that many customers from there too because i do see maybe in the city or younger generation would order from there but in Pleasanton, if someone order Pleasanton deliver to some other places, they are different delivery charge too, I believe. Mm -hmm. They cost more too. Mm -hmm. So all this, all this trouble is here and there. And then I started to worry. Mm -hmm. The first one I told my wife, I said, hey, I think it's too sustainable. Mm -hmm. Going into May, I'm thinking, hey, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> right? Because when I'm looking at this, I just, I don't know. I, all my staff stays home right now. So we just run this business with the least employees we can mm -hmm. because it costs too. I also asked for help from the landlord to give me some break from the, from the mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. And, and for supply, I mean, the supplier, the distributor, they, they raise the price because of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned the other day, the chick, I mean, the, the eggs, was less than twenty dollars a case went up to forty dollars a case now back down to twenty seven dollars so the prices fluctuate up and down like so crazy mm -hmm. so we ran through all this thing but we have to deal with it we have to face it and so far the second month going into the second month i'm looking at the number i can break even and make a little bit make a little profit mm -hmm. then i say i need to stay and see how it goes because mm -hmm. as a businessman we need to make profit when we do business and of course i have to agree with what dennis say because his experience and all these years in this business me as a new guy i don't have much to talk about but i just look at it as a from a businessman standpoint we do business we need to make profit we need to sustain and going through this pandemic is going to be bad this whole year will be the same mm -hmm. maybe worse mm -hmm. and and then again, come back to this topic here is I really appreciate the chance that I can do some work. I mean, I can, I can make some food for all of you here. Mm -hmm. That's part of the revenue coming in too. That's so I appreciate that. And that's what we have. And hopefully something positive is coming up. Yeah, no, thank you, Tommy, for that very real kind of view. In fact, this picture was super telling um, as well of, <laughs> of your business today, right? See the chairs upturned. And oh, yeah. you're in front of all these takeout boxes, you know, for food that's going out um, of, of your restaurant yeah. as it stands. That so, was actually taken a, a Saturday morning mm -hmm. uh, when we, because on Saturday we did all this. Usually on Saturday we make a lot of koi. Mm -hmm. And then I started this online ordering too. So a lot of customer pre-orders. That's how you see all these boxes. Those are all the orders from the customer. And all these colorful things. Those are great. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, they're completely appetizing. Like I said, <laughs> very mouthwatering day. Very difficult to do this project, looking at the food all day. Um, so Ellie, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your business uh, with COVID-19. What have you been doing to kind of mitigate some of uh, the drop? Well, have you ex actually experienced any drop? Because you're a food truck. You can go around the Bay Area, I suppose, anywhere. Though I should say, if Tommy is very new at this, I'm actually a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a tiny little three-month-old baby, actually. So um, we started off like uh, being doing catering and doing pop-ups in September. It was very good. And then we had our truck. The funny thing is that I got to tell you guys the truth was that um, it took us three months to, um, to complete our food truck because it was built... Um, 100% new and when we received our food truck it was actually one week prior to the lockdown mm -hmm. okay so we had our gigs lined up with the breweries mm -hmm. not without the grid or anything like that but with breweries and anything my husband is a is a, is a music promoter so he is actually pretty I uh, have uh, he has good relationships with clubs and 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 bars and all that so we had all that 
um, lined up. But of course, with the lockdown, everything crumbled. So um, there was a lot of regrouping. Um, I wasn't, well, the good thing about that is that we don't have a large overhead uh, apart from the truck that we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we only started off with just my husband and I and once in a while employing one person, right? Because we're at a small scale, uh, you know, food truck scale. Mm -hmm. So um, when the lockdown happened, so literally my husband and, and I sat down and said, okay, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but then again, you know, he's actually a researcher and he's researching. He says, oh, well, actually we're essential business. And I said, I was kind of like, oh, you know what? Let's just take a break. Let's just not start until after lockdown. And my husband says, no, why do you want to give up before you even try? Mm -hmm. So what we did was that uh, we actually parked our food truck. Um, we are based in Pacifica. Our commercial kitchen is in Pacifica. Uh, uh, with a restaurant and this restaurant named Al, Al Toro Loco, uh, which is actually Peruvian and Mexican food. They actually shut down for two weeks um, because they are very traditional and they just didn't know what to do. So that was when my husband says, hey, you know what, let's just bring each other up. Let's just bring our truck over to your restaurant and let's open, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he did and he eventually did and we did and it actually brought traffic. Uh, we did pretty well. We did pretty well. We did reach our goal on that day um and then after that uh we were being approached by my husband's best friend who actually owns a bar uh about <clears throat> a block away from the restaurant uh wanting us to be the um the open sign with our truck there because our truck is really huge and it's eye-catching you know and, and it's right off the freeway and and his uh, his friend said hey you know we need your truck uh, in order for us to open as a bar we need food um, you know, to make it an essential business. Well, because of Pacifica is this tiny little town, words go around, people are can be pretty strict with rules and all that. Uh, somehow or other, they got reported, uh, the bar got reported, and we got, quote unquote, shut down. Mm. Just to be fair with the bar, if they, they shut the bar, they have to shut us too. Wow. So okay. then we had to regroup again. <laughs> it was like, and I sat with my husband and said, okay, what do we do? You know, and um, we were not crying. I wasn't crying yet. So <laughs> then he goes like, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. We do have permits for um, Alameda County as well as San Mateo. So let's, let's go um, approach our friend who actually owns, uh, if you guys have heard of this um, restaurant called Aburaya. It's actually a Japanese fried chicken um, restaurant in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And he actually has uh, two, he has another branch. He has two restaurants and he shut down the, the small restaurant because of the COVID-19. And he invited us uh, three hours after we shut down. And he says, you know what? Come to my restaurant, open up, you know? And we did the next day. And it didn't work because it's, it's a downtown Oakland, you know, just like Tommy's situation whereby everybody's working from home and nobody's coming out. Mm -hmm. So we had to regroup again. So that was the second, the, the, the third time of regrouping. And I sat down and I told my husband and I said, we have to reinvent. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? let's do this. We're located in Pacifica. We have San Francisco people. Let's tap on them. You know, it just came up, you know, while I was cooking and I said, you know what, let's do delivery. Let's do delivery. Let's do satay. Let's start with satay first, which I did. I started off delivering to our friends first in Pacifica. We started Pacifica mm -hmm. and then we started to open up in Daly City. And then I told my husband, be ready. I'm going to open up for San Francisco. So uh, the first day was awesome. We sold out. The, the, the second time uh, we sold out and uh, we actually are doing, we were doing delivery once a week at that time. And it actually did work. And we had to regroup again saying that nobody wants to eat satay three times a week. So we have to reinvent. That was when that menu came about, you know, like, okay, let's do something to, re let's reinvent. Let's have a special just for the lockdown, like nasi lemak, for example. Right, just to make people, you know, just to get people excited when they see my Instagram and they go, okay, I want your nasi lama, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when they want that, they want my satay as well. So basically, that's like a side dish, and then the main dish is the main attraction, which is the nasi lama. Mm -hmm. So every week we have to, you know, change our specials and we rotate it. Um, was it crazy? Yes, it became really crazy with the nasi lama because we were supposed to sell only 30, we ended up selling 90, and that was only my husband and I. <laughs> Wow. My husband says, I don't want to see any more chicken for the rest of my life. But we actually did it. We, <laughs> we did it. We did pretty well. But you know what? We are, there's only two of us 
and there are so many people to feed. And that was when I started to crumble and I said, I can't do this. That's only that much of me and I'm only 5'1 and I can only take this much and how am I going to feed everybody? And that was when we had a strategy of dispersing it or rather separate the delivery into two days. And then anybody that's out of, out of our delivery area, we have a spin-off uh, delivery gate for that. Mm-hmm. So that kind of creating, creating more gigs for us. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are asking whether we are actually on pace with our projected income, of course not. You know, we're not. Because, uh, you know, like a food truck, a typical food truck, uh, the income is actually 1500 a day. Mm-hmm. Okay, so basically if we have like six gigs a day, we're selling six gigs, so 1500 times six. So basically we are not, we are not, because we are selling only once a week, mm-hmm. twice a week. Uh, I'm not complaining. I would say that I am so grateful with the Singaporeans here, you know, and also my friend, my buddy, Nora Haron, and she's taken me under her wing and just, you know, helping me to focus and like, okay, let's just stay focused. We're in this together, you know, food business, everything is together. I mean, it's not about competition as well. You know, a lot of people say, okay, well, everybody's selling Singapore food. I mean, is it competition? I said, no. I mean, like to see, like to see, I mean, I have big respect for Dennis. I mean, like, man, you're the godfather <laughs> because it's 20 years and going, you know, and Tommy just started. And I feel, you know, I feel that we're all in this together and I do want to help each and every one of us because, you know, I, I mean, like Nora Harun as well, she's also doing her thing. And mm-hmm. even though she sells Luxa, somebody else, else sells Luxa, guess what? I'm supporting both of them mm-hmm. because you know why they have utmost support for me. You know, everybody will text each other and say, how are you doing? Uh, do you need any, like for me, we have specials once a week and sometimes I run out of ideas and they would text me and say, hey, how are you doing? Are you holding up okay? And we'll talk about food and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, and, and yeah, our income has been cut, but I'm okay because maybe our ho- overhead is pretty low. And those who, uh, I mean, deliveries, that's only my husband and I, and sometimes my son-in-law. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of bad in San Francisco because my husband can do up to 20 stops okay. in one day. Wow. Wow. So <laughs> is that, is basically all of you are leveraging your families in this time of safe distancing to yes. do what you can behind the scenes to meet the demand. At the same time, you're managing suppliers that are raising prices and are themselves maybe facing supply issues. Um, I think... Dennis had talked about having ex- difficulties accessing protein on the whole um, as well, right? And I, and I hear even just from a consumer perspective that Tyson has shut down their factories because they've got a situation with a COVID outbreak at their factories. So if I think of Tyson and I think of Ellie's business and, and satay, I'm kind of worried. I'm not going to get my satay. Tofu satay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of a little bit different with halal meat. Um, you got to be on top of it. Basically, okay. you see it, grab it. You know, that kind of thing. See it, grab it, and, got you know, it. yeah. So, got and it, also, can I interject just like 30 seconds? Like, um, um, Dennis has said about the pricing, okay? I, I know uh, people have not protested with the pricing that we have, uh, but people need to understand that the pricing to make a bowl of laksa is extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. Like a blachan is extremely crazy expensive. Mm-hmm. Anchovies, ikan bilis with like my nasi lama has no ikan bilis. Yes, I do get feedback, but it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. The, the, good, the good ikan bilis, the one with no head and no whatever, right? That's mm-hmm. very expensive. So, so that's the reason why, and not just that, it's overheads. Like Dennis said, you know, you got to pay your workers. You got to pay, like for me, I got to pay for my commercial kitchen. You got to be legit. You got to be clean. You got to be certified. Commercial kitchen, I should say, I get the cheaper end of it, you know, and, and those, I would say people who actually food trucks, they pay up to 2000 3000 a month to pay commercial kitchen. Mm-hmm. So that is also wow. one reason why, you know, things besides the ingredients is also they have to pay themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, and also it's not like in Singapore whereby you pay five hundred dollars at a hawker center and you're good and you can you can even work from home, but not here. We can't even prepare food from home, mm-hmm. and people need to understand that part. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason why it's expensive. Uh, it's more, much higher, or three times the price of a misiam in Geelong or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's yeah. the reason. Why. Right, right. 
Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you, Ali. That's uh, that's that puts things in perspective. I think for us all here. Yeah. Um, if I if I may just kind of think about so so now this is a COVID time and it's you know we're all going through a difficult period. You guys are especially as well. And then we we saw a couple of uh, um, chefs, you know, um, from major restaurants and who were laid off, and then they started their own sort of takeout uh, food, right? Very sort of high end. I think they were charging twenty two dollars for a bowl of laksa. And there were some folks that were saying, well, that's a lot to pay. But Ellie, you just kind of put the numbers out for us to explain why um, it costs so much as well. Uh, Dennis, anything to add to that? Um, would life be after COVID the same? Do you think prices start going down or you know, how, no, what are... I, I don't see us going back to normal for nine months to a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So... Um, we, we have, you know, we have to start to thinking about what is this new way of doing business from now on. Right. You know, maybe, um, you know, this bulk orders with, 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 with Wilson, that's a great idea, but it depends on demand. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is, you know, if, if you don't get enough orders also this, it won't work. And, and also how are we going to do logistically with the running around and Wilson's been doing so much work. And it's not fair to expect him to be doing this all the time because, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, I'm sure he's very, very tired. I mean, I, he's, I see him, you know, drive for so many hours. And I feel really bad for him, but, but, you know, Wilson is such a high energy, you know, he's so warm and, and, and helpful, but, you know, I, I <laughs> He needs more Singaporeans to step up to help him out. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about Wilson um, and his initiative in a moment. But if I may just go over to Dennis, what do you think of life after COVID for the F&B business? Okay, Jasmine. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, okay? Uh, I'm going to first say up front and acknowledge that it is tough. I think, in fact, I think it's going to be tougher than what most of us expect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, historically, with every global pandemic, something always changes structurally. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in the midst of that change. Uh, but having said that, I do want to actually be very positive as well, right? The great thing about entrepreneurship, right, as we've all discovered, is that it's never absolute. It's always relative. So what I'm saying is, you know, let me just lighten the tone, right, by saying that, you know, uh, I always tell people, when I do change management with them, right? That is, uh, you know, there's these two guys, uh, I'm sure we all heard that story. We had these two guys who were hiking in the jungle and they ran into a lion, right? And the first one started running. And then the, and when he looked back, he saw the second guy putting on his Nike shoes, right? And he was saying, what are you doing, right? Um, you're never going to outrun a lion. He said, no, 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 no. I don't need to outrun the lion. I only need to outrun you, right? So, <laughs> so so the idea, the great thing here is we, we don't need to be geniuses, right? We, we don't need to be the, the best of the best, right? All we need to do is to think differently before everyone else. And let me tell you that this, this whole COVID-19 situation is so unprecedented that there's so much unknowns. I don't even know what's going to happen even six months from now or a year from now. Mm -hmm. But the key thing here is all of us know our respective businesses inside out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they are our babies, right? Mm -hmm. So you will know based on your cost structure, you are not based on your community, your customers, right? What is the next best step? But you need to think of it now, mm -hmm. right? You have to really um, uh, kind of like prepare for the worst, but hope for the best, right? So I think that what I'm trying to say is that I know that previously we were used to a certain way of delivering our products or our services or managing our businesses. I actually think that that probably needs to change. Like we need to think of what the, what, what's the current parameters Right, so I, I just give an example, right? Um, I've been sharing with a lot of uh, fellow entrepreneurs here in Singapore, for example, right? Now, what, what are some of the current things we can play into, right, during this whole lockdown, right? So one of the things, everyone is digital, right? So everyone has a lot of time on their hands at home now. They're not going to the offices. So the footfall has dropped, right? It's all digital now, right? Is there anything I can build around that digital community, right? And I always tell people that as entrepreneurs, it's no shame to reach out to our community, right? It's no shame to come up with a new business model. So one thing I will share with my old F&B uh, friends here in, in Singapore, right, is that 
tell everyone how tough it is, right? If, if the ingredients are expensive, right? Is it possible to live stream something? Is it possible to make a video just to explain to your community? It might not go viral to the whole world, but all you need is just your community, right? Do you have a Facebook group, for example? Do you have a WhatsApp group even, right? Talk to them about it, right? Uh, come up with a new model in terms of, okay, if, if for whatever reason, delivery cost is high, right? Is there a way we can get them to come and pick it up, right? Tell them that you need all the support today. Uh, build a new subscription model, right? If, if that works for you, right? So they have some kind of uh, cash flow predictability in the days, weeks, and months ahead, right? I think at the end of the day, we have to believe that our community is a lot more supportive and encouraging than what we think they are. So if we just reach out directly to them, you know, there's so many amazing stories now, even in Singapore, right? Or Facebook groups coming up within local communities. So, you know, the, the, the one that I'm serving today are the freelancers, right? And the freelancers were the first one to have all their income wiped out because those were the easiest to, to kill uh, upfront, right? They all have no income now. But what's encouraging is they've all been coming out with their own little communities to support one another. Some are even sharing jobs, right? Like, like when they get a job, they, they share with, with their... A lot of encouraging stories. So what I'm saying is that reach out to your community. They're a lot more supportive and encouraging than, than we think, right? We're all actually standing by you and wanting to help you as well. But we need something to hang on to, right? We, we need... We need leadership from, from you, right? We, we need you to tell us how best can we help. And it's not just a, a manual way, right? It's best if it's something digital, what's that group like? Uh, and, and, and there's a business model there, right? There's a, uh, some, I, I cannot answer for you, always the different cost structures, right? Yeah. But you need to find something that actually works for you because this, this, this whole COVID-19 situation, I think is going to, to drag on quite a bit. It's going to be, a, you know, you have read the news, it's on, off, you know, lockdowns, then you clear it, and then the numbers go up again and lock down again. And it's going to continue until some uh, vaccine comes out. And even that, we're not sure when, right? It needs to be a workable vaccine. And, and sometimes, you know, they, they might rush it and then it might not be that workable. So we have to be prepared, right? But this is the part that I, I need to be positive, right? We, we all, we're all passionate about businesses. We're all passionate about food, right? And more importantly, there is a community out there standing by you and, and, and they can't really support you. But we need to tell them how, right? In a, in a sustainable way, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's the best advice I can give. Well, great. Thank you, Dennis. And I think the, our community is standing by to, to help as well. Wilson has been, a, you know, a lot of linchpin. I think everyone, you must be wondering, Dennis, who's this Wilson, you know? Because everyone's been referring to him in the chat groups, in the conversation. And Wilson's been one of those that has, who has been driving this community effort around uh, engaging with our, you know, major Singapore hawker vendors here. Um, to get the food out of the community. Wilson, when you take it from here? Thank you, Dennis. That was super helpful and, and very real. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so just to start this off, I think it's easier for me to explain how it started. There has always been a lot of conversations about helping the hawkers and all the restaurants, especially when, um, you know, Dennis appeared on Channel News Asia. No, was it Straits Times or Chinese News, Channel News Asia? You had an article there saying a business fell. So a lot of the Singaporeans were sharing the article. And then, but it was all very segregated, very simple, small ideas everywhere. Until I think Mark, Mark came about and, you know, put everybody in the group, group chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there was still just a lot of talking, talking, talking going on. Nobody was taking action until this guy called Alan. Is Alan on the chat? Alan Khan just come. started saying, okay, screw you guys. I'm just going to start. Okay. I'm just going to go on WhatsApp group and say, hey guys, I'm going to do a show order and I'm going to help all you guys collect. I'm going to bring it down to Sunnyvale and you guys can collect from me just to make things very convenient for you. He sent out the chat, I believe, like 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. No, no, can you go back to the last slide? He sent out a chat at 3 p.m. And by 5 p.m., I think like 13 or 13 people responded to him. Okay, and that was when we sort of knew that, you know, there was interest in helping, but we just needed to make it easy for the Singaporeans to help. Money is not the issue. It's always about convenience. That's all they want, convenience. Okay, so you made it convenient for them, boom, they could get it done. Price, not important at all, okay? But one more thing I want to tell all the uh, restaurants, Ellie, Dennis, and uh, Tommy, you, it's not just about selling food. It's about selling the food and then promoting it. So I, I, I leverage a lot on social media and this whole thing blew up because I shared it on social media. If we did not share this on social media, it would not have blown up. So that, that's, a, that's a lesson for you guys. You guys just need to leverage that platform, okay? Next slide. And one of the reasons why we wanted to help Dennis wasn't just because your business was falling off. Business was falling off, uh, it's, we can't really help about that. But the next thing we know was a lot of people were turning to the online food delivery services, Grubhub, DoorDash, and all that. Um, but we knew, we knew that there was 
it was completely unsustainable. 30% cut off the top from you guys. And then on top of that, um, the consumer side, they still have the service fee. They still have the tips. They still have everything. The overall cost is way more than just 30% of the total bill. So I hope that the people listening on this chat, you, you might think like, oh, let's order from this restaurant by helping them. Yeah, they're only getting 60, 60 cents for every dollar you put in. It's really only 60 cents. And that's not including all the, you know, uh, food damages, delivery damages, and all that. It's not as sustainable. They are not, they are not making a 40% profit at all. So whatever DoorDash they are doing now, they are growing, but they are hurting the very thing that you guys think you're helping. They are hurting the restaurants more than they're helping, mm. especially during this period of time. Okay, and this chart here shows you a very good example. $1,000 of revenue, they only got $370 of it, and that's revenue, not profit. I think Dennis can tell you how much profit uh, comes from that. Wow, this is very stark, um, you know, of a stark reflection of actually what gets, gets in pocket for them. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah, so basically we wanted to come up with a way to help the restaurants, mm -hmm. but again, all the conversations, everyone has a different idea of helping. Some people just say, oh, let's order from Shook, that's helping them. Um, some people think a bit longer term. We understand like what Dennis Go has said earlier, this, this thing isn't going to go away. It's going to keep coming back because you, you see from the news, no, nobody is practicing shelter in place. No one in America is practicing it. It's very scary. Um, so there was a few objectives that we wanted to come up with. The first one is actually the restaurants itself. Uh, we spoke to Dennis, we spoke to Tommy and all that. We need to change the way business is done with you guys. Uh, we keep bringing up chick meat, chicken meats rice as an example because I feel slightly offended by that. It, it, it's chicken, chicken meats rice is not started by a Singaporean. It's just started by some American-born Chinese. Mm. How can American-born Chinese out chicken rice us? That, that's an insult. Okay? But at the end of the day, I, I, have, chick I have Dennis's chicken rice a lot. I have that chicken rice a lot as well. Um, Dennis's chicken rice beats him. But it's not about the quality. It's not about the price. It's simply about how convenient can you make it for people to come and pick it up. And that's one of the differences. Uh, chick meat rice, chicken meat rice, I think the delivery, you, I order within five minutes, I get my, my dinner, I finish in 10 minutes, I walk out. Um, Dennis's will take quite a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, so that's one thing you need to change. Um, the other thing is that a lot of people were very concerned about the short-term survival of the restaurants because by the time we reacted in uh, March, it was already two months. I think our business has gone down here for two or three months straight by then. So um, one thing that we wanted to create was a network of Singaporeans. Those who are familiar with uh, the Taiwanese and Chinese system down here, they have something called Tuan Go, Group Buy. I have introduced a lot of you Singaporeans into the group buy websites. It started by the Taiwanese and um, Chinese. If you were to go to some of the random Asian plazas here, you'll suddenly see bookshops, random bookshops out of nowhere, like nobody ever walks into the bookshop, but suddenly you realize they've been there forever. Now, these bookshops, all the 世界, 世界 书馆, all, the, all, all of them, they are actually not there to sell books. It's just a facade. They are there to help people collect these group orders. There's one in South Vienza, there's one in Yopidas, there's one in uh, Fremont. And based, uh, based on the, what I checked, they have started expanding this network as more and more businesses go down go downhill, meaning they're willing to rent out their shop spaces to help people collect Tuan Ko or group buys. Okay, and three of the most popular items on these group buy sites, by the way, Song Fa Bakute, Irwin's um, Salted Egg, the Fish Skin. Okay, just like some of the more popular items there are all from Singapore, but um, they are doing it and we are not. So just a heads up. And the last thing, actually, this one, this one was more of like how to keep this project ongoing long term is basically trying to create a kampong spirit among all the Singaporeans here. So one of the ways we did it was through this collection point system that we start up. We found that, you know, people found out that, hey, hey you stay in Oakland also. Hey, you stay in Oakland also. Like every, every checkpoint, you have five people, 10 people. Then they all realize that they actually stay close to one another. And mm -hmm. that creates little pockets of Singaporean communities within the bigger community. Okay. And so that's one of the other things that we wanted to bring out as well. Because before this COVID-19 thing, to be honest, if you, if you check the WhatsApp group, the, the conversation was pretty dead. The people were just talking when they needed something. And if there wasn't something, they wouldn't talk about it. That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. The Thank you. Slide. Yeah. Okay. And day one, how we started was after, you, uh, on March 21st, after Alan did the small little test for 13 people in Singapore, uh, Sunnyvale, 
we we wanted to ramp it up. And this was in the middle of the night, 2 a.m. I like I have no no idea how we wanted to do it, but I knew that I needed the Singaporeans involved. So I started sharing a lot of these kind of posts on uh, Facebook and WhatsApp. Okay, it's basically just hey, Singaporeans, wake up. We we need your help. If you want people to survive, you want all your Singapore food to be here three months from now, you guys need to wake up. It, that was the general message that we sent out. We had no idea then we were going to do mass deliveries. We had no idea what we were doing. We were actually leaning more towards the charity angle, meaning just giving money. For example, like um, just buying gift cards and everything. But then Alan was working with Dennis behind the scenes. I wasn't involved back then, the Dennis Lim. Then suddenly he told me, hey, Wilson, we wanted to do this whole South Bay thing. Dennis is going to prepare carrot cake. Uh, he's going to do special order. Lah. I knew about this only on Monday. Okay. I knew about this only on Monday and he wanted to do the order on Wednesday. So next. So this was how it all happened. The, that's why the first order, uh, you go to the next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Yep. Hang on. Um, just uh, pause. The yeah. Screen. But basically, so there was a lot of screw ups on the very first time we did this whole thing because we have never done it before. Mm -hmm. I know. I think you, you skip a slide. Oops. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So within a twenty, within a four, I think thirty-six hour period, we received seventy-three orders all across the Bay Area from all the Singaporeans. Now, just to give you a heads up, um, our WhatsApp group total outreach is about seven hundred and seventy people. Seven hundred and seventy people, seventy-three people responded. So that's about a ten percent response rate. That is abs That is crazy high. Okay, that means we we knew that the community wanted to get involved. It's just how do you make it simple enough for them to get involved, and that's it. But for the first run, um, basically, uh, we were one hour late for the whole delivery. There were time delays. The traffic on the road back then was still pretty bad. And because everything came late, I was bombarded. I received over 6,000 messages, Facebook texts, whatever. My phone was just, just going throughout the four four hours I was doing this. And also because I think it was the first time Dennis was doing, because it was last minute. So there were also a lot of other um, screw-ups and everything. Oh, but for Dennis, I just want to say also, um, because Dennis was trying to cut down on costs and everything, he fired a lot of his uh, front-end staff. Mm -hmm. So his family, his daughters, and his wife were all coming in to help him pack all these 73 orders. Mm. Okay, wow. and by the way, 73 orders, there were some orders, I think there were $100 or $200. There were some huge orders. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and but the good thing is, despite some of the screw-ups and everything, uh, a lot of people chose not to do refunds or anything, just took it as charity work. But, we need to get it very clear. Charity, it runs out. After once or twice, they get bored of it, they will stop doing it. So we needed to keep it more and more professional. So the next slide. So the next slide was, basically we were doing this week in, week out, week in, week out. The first week, it took me the whole week just to get it started. But right now, I, you, you guys see what I do on Facebook and WhatsApp. It's, it's, it's on autopilot right now. It still takes time to do it, but it really doesn't, doesn't take a lot of my time. Like a Saturday, I can start planning by 2 p.m. and I can get it everything done by 7 p.m. And um, this is one thing that I'm trying to make it streamlined so that I can pass it on to Tommy, Dennis, and Ellie and whoever restaurants need them next time. That means I'm trying to keep this network in place. There is a very clear demand and need for convenience, but the restaurants will have to take it over from me next time. Like yesterday, we delivered, I think, 55 orders excluding pickups. There were only two, there was only one mistake, one missing bar for me. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the orders have stabilized at 45 to 55 every single week. That's great. Mm -hmm. And basically, these are all the little poster designs I've, I've been doing for them. And this is one thing I, I hope the restaurants pick up as well is you need to involve social media, you need to put the graphics out there, you, you just need to put pictures in front of them. People are spending a lot, a lot of time on Facebook right now, a lot of time on Instagram. Put these pictures out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's it. So I prepared a lot of graphics and this took a lot of time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another thing that um, Dennis and I have been talking about also with Tommy, uh, fatigue with fresh products. Uh, Hokkien Mee is nice, but if you have Hokkien Mee every day for, for, for every week for like four weeks straight, nobody's going to order. So Dennis has been working with uh, trying to improve the variety of his menu. So we had carrot cake, a bar chow mee, uh, on there, on there, bar chang, sun kue, kue la, peace, kina, pancake. So I'm trying to get these restaurants to vary a bit because they, they, are, they are working together, but they are still in competition with one another. 
So it's important that they don't overlap in the manual choices when you do the special deliveries. So that's one thing I can help coordinate for them because that doesn't take a much time. Yeah, but, but the most important thing for uh, I think uh, any of you is actually the staples are very, very important. People don't want a situation where they order kue from you and then still have to pick up the dinner from someone else. Someone else. They want a system where I get my dinner and I get my kue. So this was seen in the last few rounds I did for Tommy. Basically, uh, because of supply issues, Tommy wasn't able to push out the main dish. And what then happened was um, the peanut pancake orders, not that many. Uh, I received only about a total of 21 orders. And the main reason I could tell was because yeah, I had to pick up the, the, your pancake and then I still must go outside and eat dinner again. It's, to them, it's too much work. So it's, you have to think of it from the mindset of a consumer going forward. How about how you want to tackle this problem? Um, Ali, I received a bit of the same feedback for the satay as well. It's not a full meal. So that's something just to think about. So maybe your nasi lemak would have been a good option and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's it. Next, the next slide. Mm -hmm. So, but, okay, this is the one thing that actually I'm very, very happy about because as uh, Dennis said already, uh, this thing is... I still have a full-time job, so this is very, very, very tiring. I haven't taken a break since SIP started. So I'm going for my own SIP after this SIP. <laughs> like, turn off my phone. Because the messages are still a bit crazy. People will like, ask me simple questions like, hey, can I have a second packet of chili? So you need to understand, it's not just you messaging me. It's a few hundred people messaging me at one point in time. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, but what I like is like... Um, when I told Peninsula that, hey guys, because none of you are volunteering, I can't really, you know, service you all. Some, I, I think, the, was, was it, who was it? Was it Eileen? Eileen from the Peninsula group said, never mind, I start my own group. She started my own group and then that, that, was, that was how we knew Ellie was there. Because I think you did with Peninsula first and you brought, and they brought you in. Then I from South Bay, I like, hey, I was one Saturday. So I bring Ellie down, further down. Okay. And SF folks right now, I can see from David's and Michelle's uh, Facebook, you guys are supporting Nora. You guys are supporting Emily and all that. That is perfectly good because um, my core group of volunteers, we are all in South Bay. We are all in South Bay. So you tell me to help Nora, I'm like, eh, how? My question will be, how you want me to help Nora? Because it's a bit too far for me. I can, but what I'm going to tell all the restaurants now, we have this network in place. I have this little collection point in place. I can tell you where most of your orders are going to be. You just need to find a way to take this over from me next time. Okay? Love but it. That's, yeah. And as I mentioned to you, the little kampong sprouting out across the bay, I, I really love it. Like, because, you know, like, I do this whole collection point through mass tech system. What you realize, these people in their mass text will be like, hey, you also stay here, you also stay here. I, I don't know. I do not know whether they, they take the conversation to the next level, but at least people know these are the 10 names. These are the five names who stay like walking distance to me. Like, for example, yesterday I was delivering to Riz Ng. Uh, Riz Ng is uh, in Richmond, El Cerrito, super far away. She was having a conversation with someone waiting for food outside her house. Then they were like, hey, I don't know you, you don't, don't know me. Yeah, hey, but we stay so close together. It, it, it feels good like, that Singaporeans are meeting each other because they're waiting for my food. It, it's just that. <laughs> okay? You know, that's brilliant. In fact, I think the, the way you do it, it kind of shows your national service training come into place. <laughs> you know, the mobilization of the different zones and all. No, 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 no. There's I'm some of that at all? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, my but, gosh. Uh, but basically, one thing that I'm going to tell all the restaurants also, there are certain areas that are, that are finding it very difficult to step up. And these areas, I'll be honest with you, are the areas with very good potential business, it's just that they tend to be where the families are congregated. Families will not volunteer because they still have to take care of kids. If you want volunteer families to volunteer to help you, for example, as a collection point, you need to make things super easy for them. Like mm -hmm. Mason, Mason is my number one collection point in Sunnyvale. Mm -hmm. It's like if I, if I drop him, my, my whole thing will collapse because that's so how many people love his house. But he cannot do the collection himself because mm -hmm. of his kid. Mm -hmm. So... I've, I've noticed this a lot in a lot of these other areas that I've spoken about because of kid reasons, like, they really cannot commit. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other areas, SF, East Bay, and the no, SF, because uh, most of them are single down there. Uh, Berkeley, most of them are single students down there. South Bay, because of tech and workers, most of them are single down here. I have a lot of volunteers. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then going forward, yeah, this is a long-term plan. Restaurants, I just want to let you know, 
we have this system in place. We have this WhatsApp group, we have this Facebook thing. The support is there. Of course, not on a weekly basis, but as I told Dennis already, you do this twice a week, three times a week, and then with all the different locations, people will buy. Okay, right now, I'm keeping it to only within the Singaporeans. If I open this up to Malaysians, if I open this up to their friends, my Taiwanese friends are asking me, and I'm not really opening up to them because I don't think we can cope. I'll be very honest with you. People are asking me. Mm -hmm. But so, this network can grow. It's just whether you guys are willing to step up and take over from me. Because as Jasmine told you already, um, people are volunteering, but not volunteering to the point where they can dedicate an entire day a week to do this or drive 180 kilometers every week to do this. So you need to cater to the volunteer. Okay, number one, protect your volunteers. Do not overwork your volunteers. The volunteer network will be there as long as you don't kill them. Um, number two, make things very, very easy for them. And because it's very convenient for them, you deliver food to their house. They, they don't mind what. They, they will be there for you. Okay? But another thing is uh, traffic is building up and food safety with the summer heat and everything is mm -hmm. something that you guys need to think about. Good how you guys point. want to do this. Yeah. Good point. That's good. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, Wilson, it looks like we're very, you know, we're, we're there to support the businesses, but I think we need to be smart about some of these different ideas. Um, mm -hmm. That's great. Any initial reactions, uh, Dennis, Tommy, and Ellie? Sorry, sorry, I, mi I missed that slide. One more slide. Okay, yeah. keep going. So keep this going. is the last slide. This is actually, you, you guys think that, you know, we, we as a Singaporean community, we're doing a lot, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to tell you, no. Um, all the restaurant owners and actually all of you guys listening, there's, the Taiwanese and Chinese have their own ways of doing things. The Americans have their own way of doing things. In terms of the Taiwanese Chinese, they use something called Tuan Kou a lot. Tuan Kou is something you guys should learn if you guys want to eat very authentic food from Taiwan, China, and all the other places. As you can see, this is just one group, 23,000 people inside. This is just South Bay. They have grown so big, what happens? They are hiring drivers to do dedicated routes to deliver from wherever the, the bookshop is and drive up to Fremont, drive up to Sunnyvale, drive up to... Um, Peninsula because they have that bulk of orders. Someone was doing bubble tea for uh, boba tea for rabbit rabbit tea uh, based in um, Westfield Valley Fair. 200 orders, I think, took less than two hours. 200 orders. Wow. If you can tap on this market, but you need to speak Chinese, if you can tap on this market, you will not die. Well, maybe Jesus we just need that. someone who speaks that language, but food is an international thing, I think, you know. Yes, you need to take the orders in their language as well, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So you need to know Mandarin. And you need to know both Qian Ti Zi and Fan Ti Zi. Do not mix it up. If you mix it up, you're going to piss off people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm coming from experience as a realtor. Do not mix up the two groups. Okay? And the next one is actually um, the Supper Club. Supper Club is more of an American thing. It actually appeared on NBC News this morning. It's basically a flash mob style. They will choose a random restaurant every week. If you join a Facebook group, and they'll tell you, okay, everyone in this group, order from this restaurant today. Now, go. Um, and yeah, it started in a Mountain View as well already. So there's a lot of different ways, but... The one thing I tell the restaurants is find your audience and after you find your audience, you need to cater to them. If you want to do the Chinese route, you need to go different from supper club. Taiwanese Chinese here will not join the supper club. They will all join the Ming Shi Ming Zui Tian Tuan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. Love how you're learning from the other communities and giving us advice here. Uh, Wilson, mm -hmm. that's, that's phenomenal. And most of all, I think I speak for a lot of us here. We truly appreciate your enthusiasm and initiative in driving this forward. Um, thank you. Dennis, any initial thoughts to, uh, to what uh, Wilson just shared? And we'll go to Tommy and Ellie in a moment. Oh, you, me? Yes. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always um, learning from Wilson. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's plugged into all the different communities here mm -hmm. and, and he's so much more tech savvy than I am. So I, I I need to learn from him and and it's a great idea. I think um, I, I I hear him that he's, you know, it is getting very hard for him to be running this thing himself. Um, I I might um, I figure there might be a way for me to hire back my front my you no know, my serving staff and get them to drive mm. the food to the different points, mm -hmm. different pickup points. That would be mm -hmm. something that uh. That I that I would like to do, and you know that I can, could be I can, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can hire them back, and then you know they get some mm -hmm. 
they have a yeah. job soon. <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, while 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 uh, Wilson was talking. Got it, Ellie. I know Tommy is busy right now, but Ellie, what do you think? You're strong in social media. We noticed that. Yes, because um, we I actually do follow a lot of food trucks, and I follow their steps on what they do. Mm -hmm. So I kind of follow whatever they do. And uh, uh, what was your question again, Jess? Sorry. <laughs> what, what do you think of some of Wilson's suggestions? Um, you know, having heard what he's been doing from a community perspective, how else can we support you guys? And, you know, his idea that we have to start enabling you guys to take this on yourself as well to scale the efforts. So I would say with the, with the delivery, I mean, we, we got this in terms of San Bruno, you know, as, as you can see that on my social media, when we do, when we open up for deliveries, it's, we have to make it small because there's only like two, three of us delivering and we want to make sure that we deliver it on time and we split into two days. So San Francisco, South City, San Bruno, uh, that's the furthest that we would go because San Francisco itself is, is, is a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would say for South Bay, we'll have to do a different day just like we did with uh, Wilson and Mason the last time and uh, Eileen had been so nice uh, with the Mid Peninsula and um, doing the middle part uh, we got that part but what i would say right now is i'm not like the restaurants uh we actually are mobile um i would say now is that we would love to actually have you know a space where maybe we can bring you know fresh satay you know to places you know that whereby we can serve hot satay there you know like you know, even in like Alameda County, uh, San Mateo County, uh, I was uh, approached by, I think it was Alan, I can't remember his name. And uh, he also was suggesting, you know, Santa Clara. And I did say that uh, we do not have permit for that, uh, but we can actually sell in a private property, private parking lot. Yes, we can do that. Got it. You know, Got so, it. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, because our food truck is certified, you know, and, and it's clean. I mean, basically, it's, it's, yeah, it's approved by the health department, but we just don't have a permit for it unless it is a private property. And, yes, I do, you know, you guys or Singaporeans have been so supportive, you know, just like Tommy and Dennis said, that we can't thank you enough, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we do get a lot of texts, you know, some people like saying, thank you so much, it hit home, and some of them get emotional, even that pop-up will hug me from the back, say, oh my God, thank you for doing this for me. And I wanna reach out, we all wanna reach out. We all wanna hit you in here, especially when we are on lockdown, you feel depressed, you can't go out, you think about home, you wanna fly home, you can't. We're bringing home to you. And uh, for me, uh, the, only, the way that uh, Singaporeans and the public can help us, not necessarily Singaporeans, is to, Find us a space where we can reach out to you in terms of our food truck. Find mm -hmm. us a, a, a private space where we can reach out to you, um, you know, and, and so that we can, you know, give you fresh food and yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understood. Tommy, any... <laughs> yeah. Thanks, yeah. Ellie. What about you, Tommy? Any initial uh, thoughts uh, and reactions to Wilson's comments? Uh, well, Tiro to Ellie and uh, Dennis. Good mm -hmm. points, and uh, that's what I want to mention as well as the mm -hmm. new new kids on the block. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got uh, it. Business will change, the the trend will change. Mm -hmm. The uh, traditional retail will 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 not really survive by by saying this way too. So we have to do something else, mm -hmm. like this Tuan Go or all this group buy thing, and then it's something really good to try mm -hmm. fast and supportive customer supportive growth. I really like it. Mm -hmm. And it, it gave me some thought to put into it. See, even after months, I need to put into a situation myself is how to support all these good customers mm -hmm. and how to how to make it fast. Uh, of course, our, our supplier as well too. We are in lean management right now, say this way. Mm -hmm. I have least employees. Mm -hmm. So we, we just need to work this out. Got and um, like this, like, like all, all details to what they say just now. Yeah, you know what, we, you know, the community has been really excited about this. So we did get a number of questions come up um, in the survey from them as well. Um, everything from how you guys started, what kind of food you offered, some impact you have and some ideas um, for this business around publicity, different business models, and so forth. Um, I know we've run out of, run past the, 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 the ideal time of 9.30, but I think what we want to do is maybe go 
for another 10 minutes or so to answer some of these questions very quickly so that at least we can discuss them in our forum here as a group. So, um, you know, if I go through this question here, that we do have some specific questions, uh, you know, and I'm just going to pick a few challenges you face making food authentic. I think we talked a lot about this, right? It's hard to be specialized in one thing when you're offering a gamut, it's hard to get close to excess. Um, you know, I think we, Dennis, we have a specific questions for you. Are you, do you have sometimes uh, different chefs cooking or is it because of the different flavors, right? There's sometimes you say the ingredients are different. That's right. I think Dennis, you're on mute right now. So you're going to have to unmute. Yeah. So, um, the recipe for all the, the dishes in my restaurant is actually, uh, my mother and my grandmother's recipe. So mm -hmm. what you're eating is actually home cooking. Mm -hmm. So you're eating laksa as you would be eating in my kit, my home kitchen, and mm -hmm. it's not, it will not be katong laksa. Or, or if you eat chili crab, it will be the way we prepare it at home. It will not be done the way they do it in, uh, you know, jumbo seafood or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is home cooking. We uh, don't use MSG or anything. So, so our food is, um, so the chef, we don't really have chefs. So we, we're basically using, uh, you know, my grandmother's recipe to cook right. and uh, the sometimes it's different is because like I say you know sometimes the chili uh, we buy it's a different spice level sometimes mm -hmm. you know certain things we buy it's, it's just not consistent mm -hmm. so so um, so for me I have to be there all the time because I want to be able to taste a lot of the food and to see it being made and sometimes you know because I do so many things I, I'm, it's not possible for me to taste everything at once so and, and we cook everything fresh every day. So uh so it's it's so like I said, I, I love feedback because then Singaporean will come and tell me, hey, you know, today your this is not lemak enough or this some too mm -hmm. salty or too sweet. And straight away I I'll go back to the kitchen and I'll say, let me taste that today. Mm -hmm. Let me taste yep, the rendang today, let me taste your curry chicken today. And that's how we can um uh you know catch it right and and and, and you know adjust it to make it, it. yeah, consistent. Got it, got it. Thank you. And then we have another question here. Tommy, can we pick up food from your home? I don't know why it's so specific, but, but uh, it sounds like people are interested in, in buying more from you and trying to figure out how they can get access to your food even at night. Oh, thanks for the <laughs> questions. Uh, after the two rounds of, I mean, two, two, yeah, uh, after the two, three hours we did, mainly in South Bay only because of my uh, capacity and my limitation. Wilson did mention to me about how can they get their food from some other regions. Uh, from my home, probably not, because <laughs> food safety is one. Our kitchen in Pleasanton. I will try to to open up Pleasanton area so that people in you know Hayward, Dublin, or Pleasanton somewhere there will be they can get there easier, closer. South Bay was because. On our on our way back, we do this group purchasing, group buying. We we head down to that direction. Mm -hmm. But of course, I would like to bring to some other lo location as well. It, it is really something I need to look into because you know our food with all this coconut milk, mm -hmm. it will it will spoil easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want you to have a sour taste nasi lemak. Got it. Say that Got way. It. <laughs> but we will need to work out something. That's, that's great. Thank you. You know, we talked about bulk purchases. Wilson said a little bit about that. But I mean, we're seeing a call for bulk, um, bulk supplying. It sounds like pe people are hoping you can get together for food festivals um, after the uh, shelter in place, um, which, which sounds awesome. Uh, but at the same time, there's a part of me that's wondering, could you, um, just thinking out of the box, could Tommy supply Kui Kui to Dennis and Ellie? And then could you guys supply food to him so that you guys can all cover different zones together? Perhaps um, are the menus potentially complementary in that sense? Because it's very um, hard to create nonia food, but there are desserts in Dennis's world, you know? And, and Dennis, you have a lot of main food that Tommy doesn't make. And, you know, and maybe, you know, so there, I'm wondering whether you guys might be you know, one idea might be to get together and, and yeah, complement. There was an idea in some of the questions or ideas on a combo. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, can I answer that? Maybe. Yes, please. Yes. 
All right. So just, I know that the question is really, um, it is a good question, but it can also be an impossible question for the three of us. <laughs> it's, a, it's an impossible mission, actually, because like, Dennis will have his bulk, and you know, when we get a lot of orders, we go, <laughs> So basically, it's like we are trying to not make mistakes on each and every order, but to coordinate with the other businesses, it can be really uh, chaotic, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it can be really chaotic because being in it myself, and Dennis, all I know that he has staff as well, but it is still, it is really crazy you know you got to be on it and mistakes do happen you know and and we don't want to like okay if you want to order uh nyonya kueh from tommy uh then you can get it from our menu it, it, it's a good idea but it's not it's hard for us to achieve that mm -hmm. i think um i want to say something to tommy as well i do want your kueh actually <laughs> It's hard for me to get, and I know that you say the capacity that's that's a lot a little bit of you know um not enough staffing or like that. Maybe I can suggest for you to spread it Monday to Friday, you know um you know like doing deliveries Monday to Friday like some I'm telling you San Francisco people they are crazy and they love food, so if you open up for other days, possible Monday Tuesday Wednesday I'm speaking for them too because I want some. <laughs> So that is, you know, like my, create something, something for you to do. And you know what? It might be good. You never know, you know, and it's kind of scary to every day. Like you got to work so hard, like, oh my God, it can be overwhelming, but it, it might work, you know, but um, I don't know whether uh, the three of us can actually get together to make it into one big menu and then, oh, you're going to order satay from me and then laksa from Dennis and then Tommy and do nasi lama. It can be a little bit chaotic. I think, I, I, I think, to say I, something, I think, um, for Tommy, I I can I think we can work together mm -hmm. because I wasn't able to get your minchang kueh the last time because they weren't delivering to me, so and I couldn't get any of your stuff. So yeah, maybe if 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 you tell me you know how long your 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 kueh can can hold, and if you can you know you send it to me on a Friday, and on a Saturday I we do my delivery and we put it together and then uh mm -hmm. send that out. You know, yeah. then I, I get my, my quick cravings. And then uh, I don't... <laughs> it's easy for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't have to do the quay and, 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 and then, uh, you know, I do my... And then do, they do the usual delivery. I, I don't know. That could be an idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Especially during these times when I think you guys, we all talked about how you're, you're um, optimizing your menu, right? Based on your yeah. skills and de demand and supply. So if you have each some specialty, perhaps that would help... Uh, drive um you know yeah you know I, I, you can you can bring your kueh at, to my place and then on saturday they pick up your kueh and deliver to all the way mm -hmm. to san francisco now yep and perhaps uh, you can you can carry some of his uh, nasi lema or ellie's nasi lema or yeah exactly exactly and yeah. then if, if 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 ellie wants to do uh south bay and you know you you you, you bring it to me on on a saturday and then uh they yep. come and pick it up from my place on a Saturday when they do the other deliveries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be an idea. So, so, well, so you just need to bring to one place. You just bring to right. my, my, my shop. That's and right. then from there, it's just going to go all the way to... Um, yeah, that's a you know, good idea, actually. Just one, yeah. one point, one pickup point. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a good idea. Something to think about. Yes. Yeah. 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 Super. So one <laughs> idea on the board. Yay. Um, but I think also another thing that... <laughs> Hui mentioned. So this is great to see. Thank you guys because we're so excited to see more of our food out there. And I think it will help in the volunteers as well. Um, another idea was around the whole uh, $15 threshold for Grub for some of these food ordering places. And the suggestion here was to have essentially a menu that, that makes it easy for you guys to reach um, the $15 threshold per order so that uh, it's easier for people to order uh, without uh, paying extra surcharges to these uh, third-party delivery centers. Yeah, so that was another idea that sort of came up, which, which sounds great. So I don't understand this $15 threshold. So I think there's a $12 or a $15 threshold uh, for some of these uh, ordering companies. Kui Kui was explaining to us that um, when she orders through Uber Eats or, or some, something like that, they actually have, uh, they, you have to pay a delivery fee if, you, if your order is too small. But if it's above a $15 threshold or something, 
they actually waive that delivery fee for the consumer. So pe people are more inclined to buy things up to the point of $15, so they don't have to pay the delivery fee. And most of these items could be like tea or, you know, something else like an appetizer that, that goes with the menu and all. That was one, one idea that she had um, during our prep call. And I think, Ali, you talked about how you're also looking at pricing your menu in a mixed way. I think that is a price point suggestion where people would not, because what Hui Hui mentioned was uh, she needs to spend $15 mm -hmm. regardless. So mm -hmm. that could be a price point, a suggestion for mm -hmm. user or for, for customer to, to spend without thinking too expensive. Mm -hmm. like, like I understand, I do understand because Wilson did mention to me about my 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 price. Hey, your 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 kui or all this thing, sixteen dollars? Are you sure or something like that? I do see that too. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, definitely something to 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 think about and look into it. Yeah, and I think uh, <laughs> Dennis's point on making clear, um, you know, people sometimes think that for your price, our prices here in the U.S. are expensive but it's really hard to get access to resources and, and the, the materials, right? So that helps. But I think at the same time, the delivery companies are wanting to um, you know, charge unless there's a threshold reach. So maybe it's a combination of value. So it's not just one item, but a few things at the same time. Um, just moving on from that point, I do, we do have a question that came up in, the, um, in some of the pre-survey questions, but also um, from AT online here, to sell frozen dishes from the menu. A lot of restaurants are doing this and people like this for convenience, um, as you can see from my batang at home here. So, <laughs> yes, Dennis, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think uh, certain dishes uh, we, you can freeze and, and, and keep for a long time, like batang, for instance. But a lot of things you can't, like, for instance, I, I think the kueh is very hard to keep for a long time. And a lot of my dishes that have coconut inside, you know, I, I, I mean, we don't use um, preservatives or anything inside. Everything is natural and fresh. And, and the kind of food that we have in Singapore is you cook it, you eat it. Mm -hmm. You know, and the next day at the most, you know, you don't want to keep it for too long. Mm -hmm. And so none of our food, I think, uh, is, is safe to, to be, you know, frozen and then eat again. It, it, it wouldn't be good anymore. The texture... I think it's just going to be different. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a good point. I agree with you. And I think um, there was a suggestion on spices and whether you guys might want to store some of your spices and sauces or, you know, um, as Insta packs or something that people can, can use. That's, that's something that's maybe hard to do for Tommy's business too, right? Because of the coconut milk factor. Um, Dennis, is that the same thing for, for your business too, in terms of main dishes? Oh yeah, because uh, I, I I can make I can make the, the the sambal and everything, but because we don't put preservatives, mm -hmm. and and I, I sell it to you, you bring it to home. If you, if you don't store it properly, you know maybe in two or three days it starts going to start getting moldy, and you're going to say, mm -hmm. hey, what's going on? You know, I I bought this for X dollar and now it's moldy. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a whole can of worms that Got it. I, I cannot Got be it. responsible for, and Got so it. also a lot of food safety issue. Um, the kitchen that you, you prepare certain food in, if you want to do it, packaged food to be sold or people to bring home, there's certain certification you want to get that you need. Um, you know, like, like I, I mentioned before, uh, Nora, mm -hmm. no, not Nora, Nona Lin, she's, mm -hmm. she's the expert on, on this, mm -hmm. you know, how to preserve and can and packaging. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I've, I've, I've explored with her before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know when... When you do volume like that and packaging it, I, I think maybe we, I don't know how to do it. So the, 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 the taste is lost. Got or, it. You know. Well, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you that online here, we have people saying they love your new hyang. So <laughs> um, put that on your list if, you, <laughs> if you're ever thinking about doing that. Ellie, how, how many days do, you, do your sauces last? Because I actually have some in my fridge now. I need to know. I get that question all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, according to the food safety rule, <laughs> right. you can actually keep your peanut sauce up to seven days. Oh, um, good. However, if you want to keep it forever, you need to put it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. That will actually stop 
the 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 food from getting you know um, deteriorating you know and all that so um but technically if you're talking about auntie style singapore style you know our aunties and moms will always say like peanut sauce will last forever because mm -hmm. you know they don't really have uh it has only basic ingredients in there so it will not spoil you know too fast however mm -hmm. i would say professionally seven to ten days but don't go beyond seven days so totally up to you if not then you're going to have to put it in the freezer if you can you can last up to six months but i will not guarantee the you know the taste of it after that you know Got and also, can i interject a little bit about uh freezing frozen food yes okay so i think dennis tommy and me we actually take really great pride with our food meaning that it's authentic there's no preservatives nothing so basically if we we do not it's not in our radar actually i would say i'm speaking for myself that i would not represent anybody but i will not also sell frozen food the reason is because like food safety issue like dennis mm -hmm. said also because if somebody somebody said hey i want 50 frozen satay from you sure you come to pacifica to my kitchen i'll sell you 50 and then you're gonna if you live in san jose and you see pacifica why wow, it's so beautiful i'm gonna go to the beach after that and then after that you go back to san jose and it's already thought for four hours and then you put it in the freezer and then you take it out and then you and then somebody's gonna get sick and then we're gonna get sued so <laughs> mm -hmm. and also another thing that i learned also if you have anything that's frozen like danny said about nona lim it's totally a different um commercial thing altogether mm -hmm. like nora mm -hmm. told me that you got to send it for labeling mm -hmm. you got to send it for instructions on how to do things um so far i've said no to frozen food mm -hmm. because it will not keep the flavor as how we present it to you mm -hmm. as how it's intended to because they don't i don't want people to come to me and say hey how come the taste is different hey how come when i defrost it it tastes different mm -hmm. you know we don't want that you mm -hmm. know we want to serve you hot piping hot you know mm -hmm. So, you know, frozen food, yeah, you might have to go to Nona Limbs for that, maybe. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. So yeah. I'm going to try, I appreciate all your feedback and, and uh, comments here. Um, and as I try to wrap up this evening, I wonder if uh, Dennis has any sort of additional, Dennis Go, <laughs> that too, Dennis, so Dennis Go, if you have any additional feedback regarding some of these ideas that the community's come up with and what you've heard so far from Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was just quietly listening and, and I think these are all great ideas, right? It's great that the community is rallying around, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 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 the restaurants. And I think, to me, my personal favorite is always cash flow, right? So I think if, if there's anything that works, everyone has different cost structures, like I said earlier, and operational uh, challenges. But if, if there's anything that works where you can actually unlock cash flow upfront, to me, that is, is ideal. So I'm, I'm thinking of things like, you know, meal plans, uh, you can plan ahead, you know, uh, I'm sure the community is willing to to pay something upfront for the next four weeks or something. If you can, if you can give them some variety over the next four weeks, uh, you're right, you can't eat the same dish uh, every day, but you could uh, spec it out for them. If you, if you could have some uh, uh, next four weeks of dishes, right, and every day is different or something, and there's enough volume, that could be something there as well. I like the idea about the, the buildings, right, uh, targeting uh, 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 localized areas, right, where you get everyone there to take a survey. The great thing about digital mm -hmm. today, uh, nowadays, is that you can actually validate very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you could actually or from uh, local pockets that you're targeting, what is the kind of demand, right? This is the whole, everything they read in Lean Startup, right? That, that, that famous book. So the idea is just validate and validate and, and find out. And then once you have enough numbers and people are willing to open their wallets and, and put in something up front, I, I think that's where uh, there's something there, right? That, that, that you could work on. So stay strong, guys. Uh, I mean, everyone. Uh, I just want to make sure that, that you all survive as well. Uh, feel free to, to, to reach out to me. I, I, I already told uh, Jasmine, right, that if there's any way I can help uh, 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 for what it's worth, I'm happy to just share you some advice along the way as well. If you want to throw some crazy idea at me, uh, I'm equally crazy myself. Uh, just, 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 just let me know, and I'll be happy to uh, spend some time with you uh, working this through. But most of all, it's a community, right? Because uh, I'm only one person, right? So the most important thing you need to get your community behind you, uh, keep engaging them, and most importantly, stay positive. This whole COVID nineteen thing that I'm really worried about is always the mental side. I'm serving the freelancers, like I said. So uh, you need a community, be real and honest with them, and I, I know they're going to rally around you. So all the best, everyone, and and let's keep the flag uh, flying high for Singapore, right? Thanks so much, Dennis. Those are really uh, wonderful words. Rallying words for us too, um, and inspirational coming from, you know, 
headquarters Singapore, <laughs> mainland motherland for us in Singapore. Um, <laughs> yeah. So thank you. You know, I think I, Veronica in, in the chat window, I put it on so well too. She said the food really brought us comfort during these, this challenging time. Um, you know, I would say I've eaten more Singapore food than I have in the past couple of years, thanks to Wilson and all the initiative and the desire to support our community here. Um, so Dennis, great, great points. And thank you for joining us today. And many thanks to the vendors here. I'm going to swing over to Mark uh, very shortly because we have a lot of feedback from the community on ideas, you know, as well around publicity, business delivery models, combos, pricing, low cost efficiency, quality, lots of cool ideas that they've had. And uh, what's that? Tiger beer. Oh, Wilson, <laughs> are you making us jealous? Where did you get that? He's not sharing his sources. Uh, one more point to make. Um, show actually... <clears throat> Shok actually sells Tiger Beer. And Dennis, there were a lot of people commenting that they could not find this on your menu, on your online menu. So perhaps you want to add this to your menu. There were people looking for this. James, James Young, uh, he keep messaging me, where did I get this? Okay, there's a lot of demand for this. But I know we can't pay. But guys, we can't deliver this, okay? We can't deliver. But you can pick up. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, Mark, over to you, please. Okay, there's just so much that has happened. Um, first, I just want to thank all of you, of course, for coming on. And next, I'd like to thank everyone who uh, warmly participated in the survey. Uh, it really means a lot. I know some people just want to come and listen, but we as organizers and uh, volunteers and all the restaurant owners that we are trying to help in our community really appreciate good, uh, transparent, honest, and detailed feedback. So I'd like to share... Uh, in fact, one of the questions I thought of asking was, have you eaten more Singaporean food, true or false? Uh, yes or no, during this time, I think Jasmine just uh, preempted that too. Uh, taking this on, I just want to encourage everyone to, to keep volunteering, as you've also uh, gladly helped Wilson and company. Uh, Singapore Connect is an organization uh, for the community by our community. The reason we've been doing these forums, the reason we went to pick the restaurant owners to talk to was because we wanted to help them. And it obviously cannot just be our core committee uh, that is doing the, you know, all the grunt work. It really needs the community. All of you are listening uh, to volunteer. And if you have ideas, as Alan and Wilson have had, uh, go and take it to the next level. Publicize, use your social media, use our Facebook uh, group page on Singapore Connect or other uh, platforms to spread the word and be responsible, of course, uh, take safety and health as key priorities. Uh, one of the reasons we were uh, careful on the Singapore Connect name with this uh, initiative was we just wanted to be also careful with any liability. So we are very glad that all this has happened without uh, any sense of, uh, you know, touch wood, like, like uh, you know, a greater health issue. So definitely stay safe and healthy. Uh, happy to have all the uh, help of the volunteers so far and really encourage all of you to volunteer even more. Uh, that's what we in the community love to see because we as the organizers actually feed off your energy. If no one is going to volunteer for something, we also don't feel enthusiastic. When people start saying, I have an idea, I'm going to help do that. We feel in keen to, to kind of ache you on and connect the volunteers together. Um, one last thing, um, we actually have been recording these videos uh, since I think session number four. And I'd like to share that all four of the prior videos are now uh, posted on YouTube. The links are as shown on the slides and they're public. You, you may share them. Please note the disclaimers because many of our guest speakers are speaking in their personal capacity on uh, opinions. So, you know, all the usual uh, disclaimer about uh, the risk of taking the information. But, but we also do this for the community and certainly this video uh, will be up after we have done some editing and such. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for organizing this. Absolutely, okay. so, so happy to have you guys here. And again, you know, we're we're definitely happy. We're we're so grateful for your businesses for all that you do to, you know, keep the Singapore culture alive in the Bay Area. And uh, certainly want to see you around for many more years. Um, I think so I should also add a little anecdote. Um, I think we didn't mention it, but the. We've actually gotten feedback, not just from Singaporeans, but even the American community, even those who did not even go to show. I believe uh, 
there was secret service or something, I, you know, anecdotes we've heard where they've ordered the food and they just said to our diplomatic community, this is so awesome. Yes. And I can still remember the taste. So these are the <laughs> kinds of uh, reactions that we have heard from people who we, you may not expect to have really enjoyed the food. Um, we're talking non-Singaporeans. So I just want to just shout out to all uh, the, the restaurant and you know, you're keeping Singapore's hawker culture, uh, the flag, you know, bearing it really well and high in the Bay Area and we encourage, and that's why we're supporting all of you. Well, thank you thank for you. all thank your you efforts. Thank you very much. As Dennis said, you know, keep your chin up and let's keep moving forward. This is happening all over the world, but you have a community yeah. behind you. And we're so excited that uh, you're here and we want to work together with you to ensure that we go through this period together. Great, guys. Thank you so much for this evening. It's been a really wonderful conversation. I am so hungry now. I think a lot of people <laughs> online are feeling the same way. I have to go start warming up some of my food <laughs> with, uh, that I have frozen up, take out my secret stash of satay sauce and my batsang that I'm staring at right here. So I'm... <laughs> you know if we need a volunteer now, I would love to have a social media volunteer because someone asked if we have an Instagram hashtag. We, we, we need people who are of that generation. I know. Wilson, you know, come on, look at him. He's all his graphics. I think we have a bunch of talented people here. So thanks, guys. Feel free to reach out to us through our chat groups. Um, um, we'll certainly have this available, of course. And if you have more questions, feel free to message on the chat window in Zoom. I'll keep that alive for a little bit more. And I'll certainly uh, put uh, the the three of you guys in touch with uh, Dennis Go as well, um, who has super, super kindly you know, joined us this evening, uh, very last moment. Um, so thank you, Dennis, for sharing your expertise uh, from Hungry Go Where. So this is amazing. Thank, thank you. you. All right, guys. Okay, thank thank you. you. Good night for now. Good night. Have a great week ahead. Good night. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.